Now begins the most recent exciting and surprising of our discoveries. It was in August of 1843 that Michael II, after being granted official permission to do so, had married Jane Bryan. He was not officially pardoned until 1845. From the record of the ship The Swan passenger list, travelling from Tasmania to Victoria, Australia in 1848, Michael II and Jane were listed as having travelled with four children. We now know that Michael and Jane, unmarried at that time, had a son William in 1840, which would have been soon after Michael arrived in Tasmania. After their marriage and in 1844, their second child, also named Michael, was born, Sarah in 1847 and then Catherine in 1848. The family moved to Geelong, Victoria, and young Michael III attended Geelong Grammar School. In 1864, now aged 20, and aboard the ship the Eldinger, he arrived at Westport, New Zealand, and walked down the west coast of the South Island, over the Crown Range and eastwards into the goldfields of Arrowtown, central Otago. This was a journey of approximately 350 miles. Those with local knowledge of this country can be in awe of Michael's feet, as the land over which he travelled is just a narrow stretch bordered on one side by the Tasman Sea. The other border is a range of towering mountains, the source of hundreds of rivers and their mouths, which he would have had to cross. As the annual rainfall here is the highest in the country, it would not be difficult to imagine the danger of negotiating these rushing torrents. Michael eventually became Mayor of Queenstown, Cromwell and Lawrence, and his name is on one of the gold shields on the Lawrence mayoral chain. With the advent of computer-aided encyclopedic knowledge, we have discovered just prior to writing up this history that Michael's mother Jane and his three siblings also came to New Zealand. Records from past newspaper writings in the Otago Daily Times mention Kathleen and Sarah, two of the family being married from their mother's home in Dunedin. This we thought strange. Why was there no mention of the father, Michael II? Then we recently also just found William's grave in the Southern Cemetery in Dunedin. That was in December 2014. He died at the young age of 26. I sent for his death certificate, which shows he died of pathysis, the archaic name for consumption or tuberculosis. Here is the heart-rending epitaph written by his mother on his gravestone. We noticed that he was given his mother's maiden name, Brian, as a second name. Sacred to the memory of William Brian Frere, who died January the 11th, 1866, aged 26 years, erected by his affectionate mother. But why should I grieve? Could I wish him again to linger a life, a vassal of pain? Oh no, his pure spirit is happy and free and must not again be encumbered for me. Spurred on by this knowledge, Gwyn and I then thought to check the cemeteries in Geelong, Victoria, and were almost instantly rewarded. There is a record dated 8th of August 1870 of Michael II having died of stomach cancer after seven days in hospital. He is buried in the Methodist section of the Geelong Eastern Cemetery. Obviously, he and Jane parted company after 23 years of marriage, and she, together with her family, came to New Zealand and settled in Dunedin. Knowing that Michael III had arrived in Westport in 1864, and William died in Dunedin in 1866, we can assume the family emigrated from Geelong in 1865. Brenda Mackey, nay Clark, my sister, moved to live in Melbourne in April of not 2014. Together with a friend, she made a visit to the Geelong Cemetery in early 2015. This part is so old, some of the gravestones are missing. Guided by the map in the sextant's office, she found her way to just a bare grassy patch over eight graves. Amazingly, there were headstones propped up against the fence of an adjoining gravesite, 
and one was that of Michael the second. It could well have been missing altogether and we would not have had this hard evidence. Our family has tried to clean the years of lichen from the gravestone as well as they can. The inscription that they have uncovered is significantly without emotion, just factual. While other gravestones nearby bear such phrases as in loving memory, Michael states, In memory of Michael George Freer, died 8th August 1870, aged 58 years, erected by his family. However, we must acknowledge that the family made the efforts to respectfully mark his death for future generations. One can only speculate how the hardships of Michael's imprisonment, convict voyage and harsh manual labour in Tasmania may have moulded his youthful personality and affected his abilities to form normal, happy and healthy relationships in family life. For further historical reading, Michael III is mentioned on page 134 of Golden Days of the Lake County by F. W. G. Miller. Another book by the same author, Gold in the River, gives the reader an excellent feel for the conditions of living in those gold mining fever times. Settled in Lawrence, central Otago, Michael III married Jane Anderson in 1866. Jane and Michael had 14 children. William Michael, 1867 to 1948. Helen Florence, 1869 to 1949. Charles Anderson, 1871 to 1932. Harry Walter, 1873 to 1953. Alice, 1875 to 1876. Francis John, 1877 to 1934. Jane Mary, born 1879, but her death is not recorded. Beatrice May, 1880 to 1968. Jean Alice, 1882 to 1925. Ethel Maud, 1884 to 1961. Ella Magdalene, 1887 to 1927. Albert Vernon, 1889 to 1967. Arthur Headley, 1892 to 1985. And Hugh Selwyn, 1894 to 1979. This is a very valuable and historic photograph. It shows Michael in front of his drapery business in Lawrence. Written in the back, in Michael's own handwriting, are the names of those in the photo. It is amazing to record here that out of this large family, only Harry Walter had a son, Jack. The other family members either did not marry, married without issue, or had daughters. Fortunately, none of them was given Michael as a first name. Two of the 14, Alice, died in infancy and is buried in the Freer family plot in the Lawrence Cemetery in Otago, and Ella was killed in a horse and buggy accident in Kaikoura. She is buried in the Kaikoura Cemetery, North Canterbury. Jack had one son, Malcolm, who has one son, Daryl. Daryl does not look as though he will marry, so there, to date, it seems the family name will die out. The detailed and full obituary for Michael Freer from the records of the Otago Daily Times 1st of August 1918, which follows, gives an excellent summary of the facts of his life. Word was received in Dunedin yesterday of the death in the morning at Kaipoi of Mr Michael Freer. About a month ago, Mr. Freer had a rib broken by an accident, and since then has been suffering ill health, being affected by heart trouble. Mr. Freer was born at Launceston, Tasmania, 74 years ago. He was in Victoria as a lad, and came to Otago about 1865, settling in Queenstown, where he and Mr. G. Marshall were partners in a stationery and book-selling business. Subsequently, Mr. Freer went to Cromwell to take charge of Hallenstein's drapery shop. He stayed in Cromwell for a number of years and was elected mayor on several occasions. His next move was to Lawrence to go into the drapery business on his own account. After that, he had a draper's shop in Queen Street, Dunedin. He retired from that business some years ago 
and took up the duties of collector for the Hospital and Charitable Aid Board, a position that he held until quite recently when he made up his mind to enjoy his leisure at Kaipoi. Mr Freer had a seat on the first Education Board of Otago, selected in 1878. Of the 69 candidates nominated, just nine were elected. In later years, Mr Freer became chairman of the Education Board. He was known in recent years as an enthusiastic office bearer in the School Committees Association. Mrs Freer survives her husband, and the members of the family are Mr William Freer and Herbert Haynes employ, Mrs F Roach and four other daughters, the Reverend Charles Freer of Phillipstown, Canterbury, Mr Harry Freer in the employ of Beeth & Co Christchurch, Mr Frank Freer in Cobb & Co's service at Fielding, but now in camp, Hugh and Arthur Freer at the front, and Mr Albert Freer in the official assignee's office at Auckland. The flag at the Otago Education Board's office was flown at half-mast yesterday as a mark of respect to Mr Freer's memory. As you can gauge from the above obituary, Michael Freer was a very well-respected and community-minded man, so much so one can believe that Jane had very little help from Michael in the day-to-day -day running of her large household. Combining the following two photographs, we have 12 of the family of 14. Alice died in infancy and Ellen, also called Helen, is absent. I think this is such a splendid photograph. I still have the locket that my great-grandmother Jane is wearing. This is Michael and Jane Frere, surrounded by eight of their 14 children. In the back row from the left, Ethel, Beatrice, Jean. The middle row, Arthur, Albert and Jane, and in the front, Hugh and Ella. Hugh was born in 1894, so I would guess this photo was taken about 1897-98. Another precious historic photograph, this time of Michael Frere and four of his seven sons. From left, William, Charles, Michael, Harry and Francis. I believe that Francis served in the Boer War and returned to live in Fielding. He was in San Francisco during the devastating earthquake in 1906, sending a cable home on the 25th of April to say that he was safe. He married Elizabeth Catherine Allen in 1911. The following is the ministry of the Reverend Charles Anderson Frere, 1918-32, at the Church of the Good Shepherd, Phillipstown Christchurch. Charles Anderson Frere was born in Dunedin and studied at Selwyn College. He was ordained in 1896 after two years as curate attached to the college. From 1896 to 1901, he was curate at St Michael's in Christchurch and then vicar at Waikawaiti until 1904. His next move was to St Stephen's at Tuahiwi near Kaiapoi, North Canterbury until 1917. From 1915 to 1917, he was also chaplain of the Māori Armed Forces. During his years of work among Māori, Reverend Frere became an authority on Māori legends and folklore, and he became regarded as a tohunga, the repository of sacred law. He acquired also a profound knowledge of the law relating to native lands and to tribal laws. It was through his efforts that adequate medical treatment was secured for Māori. He was a friend of the chiefs Tairoa and Parata. His work resulted in the establishment of the Ohoka Māori Girls College in 1909, and he was chairman and chaplain of the school when it was removed to Ferry Road Christchurch, where it became known as Te Wai Punamu Māori Girls College. The Reverend Charles Frere married Annie Isabel Maclean. Charles had a great heart for the Māori people and spent a large part of his ministry amongst them at Tuahiwi, near Kaipoi and Phillipstown. The Māoris gave Charles and Annie a baby girl, who they named Rima Faith Frere. Born in around 1908, Rima Frere was the daughter of Margaret Parata and Te Oti Kererai Tairoa and granddaughter of Naitahu leader Hori Kerai Tairoa. 
Rima received her secondary education at St Margaret's College, Christchurch. She trained as a physiotherapist and worked in Hamilton before marrying Sydney Thorne George, an Auckland stockbroker, in 1950. She died in Auckland in 1972. Below is her portrait, painted by a famous New Zealand artist of the day, Elizabeth Kelly. This portrait is part of the permanent collection of the Christchurch City's Art Gallery and is exhibited there. The following notes are taken from the Art Gallery's description of the portrait. Toi Toi Hine Tahara Rima Faith Frere, artist Elizabeth Kelly. Given an elegant invented title, it was shown as one of a pair, the other depicting a young woman of European descent that together symbolised New Zealand's bicultural heritage. The portrait was next shown in London in 1936, then for many decades from 1942 at the New Zealand Embassy in Washington. The following is a quote from a biography of the artist in a thesis held at the Canterbury Public Library. Elizabeth Kelly has portrayed her, Rima, in a way that showed her cultural background but also posed her in the manner of a European beauty. The portrait was first exhibited at the Paris Salon in 1935. The work was designed to display many facets of Marudom. The feathers and flax headband, punamo earring, bone tiki, cloak and miri. It is most unusual, I believe, for a Maori woman to be depicted holding a miri, which is a green stone club. However, the most detailed treatment is given to the face, signalling that this is the most important aspect of the work. Kelly has painted her skin with fine brushwork and subtle changes in tone. Elizabeth Kelly was born in Christchurch in 1877 and trained at Canterbury College School of Art. Throughout the 1930s, her portraits were hung regularly at the Paris Salon and Royal Academy exhibitions in London where she received several medals, awards and honourable mentions. In 1938, Kelly became the first New Zealand woman artist to receive the CBE, Commander of the Order of the British Empire, for services to art. She died in 1946. But back to Charles Frere. He and Annie did have a child of their own, a daughter, to whom they gave the Māori name Te Aumuhurangi, which may be translated to go into all the world, shortened by her fam family to Rangi. The family moved to Phillipstown, a suburb of Christchurch in 1918, and Charles became heavily involved in various social and welfare groups. He was keenly interested in the missionary work of the church, paying many visits to the Chatham Islands and twice visiting Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. He also held retreats for Māori clergy at Rotorua. His wife Annie was deeply involved with her husband's work with the Māori people. She was described as a lady of considerable culture. The peace movement also commanded her time. In 1928, as a found member of the League of Nations Union, she led a New Zealand delegation to the Pan Pacific Women's Association Conference in Honolulu. Her interest in pacifism and international affairs caused her to visit Washington, D.C. as a delegate to the International Women's Conference. Charles' name was also on the foundation stone of the sanctuary of the Philipstown Anglican Church. Sadly, the church was destroyed in the disastrous earthquake of the 22nd of February, 2011. Charles Anderson Frere died on the 2nd of March 1932, aged 61. He was buried at Bromley Cemetery, where a large group of Māori from Tuahiwi paid graveside tributes. Annie died 8th of March 1939. Long and fulsome were the emotional laments given in the tributes at the funeral of Charles. One, taken from the press Friday, March the 4th, 1932, covered one and a half full columns of the newspaper. It reads, The funeral of the Reverend C. A. Frere, who died on Wednesday last, took place yesterday, the service being held at the Church of the Good Shepherd Phillipstown and later at the Bromley Cemetery. The Bishop of Christchurch, the Right Reverend Campbell West Watson, 
conducted the first part of the service at the church, and the Reverend Charles Perry of St Michael's Church, assisted by the Reverend K. Scholar, celebrated the requiem. There was a large attendance both at the church and at the graveside, including representatives of all those organisations with which Mr Freer was connected. All of Māori from Tuahiwi attended the funeral and brought a native kākahu mat, which was draped over the coffin. At the graveside, after the ceremony, the Māori sang a lament and paid oratorial tributes to Mr Freer. The addresses which were given in Māori language were interpreted. The native service commenced with the hymn Piko Ne Te Matenga, When Our Heads Are Bowed in Woe, and an apakura lament was given by Marakura Pitama, mother of Te Aratara Pitama, one of the leaders of the party. Depart, O chief, depart into the soft veiled shades of the spirit land, stated Hoani Kin in his native tongue. Go to him who is the Alpha and Omega, the creator and preserver of all mankind. Depart to our forebears who are hunting in the happy hunting ground. Today our hills and valleys are filled with the waters of unbelief. Now you are not with us. We are left as a remnant without a leader. Again I salute you and pray that your spirit will rest in peace. Kiriapa Harawira, a church warden of Tuahiwi, said that Mr Freer, their former vicar, had been the agent of inspiration that had brought about a revival of the national spirit of the Māori, raising their status both socially and spiritually. They would treasure the wisdom and love he had brought down to them from the great prophet of Nazareth. In the spirit of the Māori forebears, everything that was born must die, but not in vain, for we died in the hope of the resurrection. Farewell, go to the land of our fathers, brothers and sisters, said Hanuera Rupene. Go to those who were privileged to walk in the great temples of knowledge. We shall surely follow you. You have done well for your Māori children. Depart, having first carried well the responsibility and organisation laid down by the late Reverend Canon Stack. The hearts of your Māori children are stricken. They shed tears for the one they loved. Depart into the greater land of eternity where the saints await you. The Pākehā people might think it strange for the Māori so to pay tribute at the graveside of one they loved, said Te Aratara Pitama. In the unorthodox ceremony, the Māoris were expressing their love and admiration for the man who had served the Māori people throughout the length and breadth of the South Island. He trusted that the church would give due recognition to their great benefactor. His greatest deeds were known to few, but the returned soldiers of Tuahiwi wished to pay tribute to their padre, whose place no other could take. As, according to the Māori proverb, another bellbird was born for each that died, so he hoped that another father Frere would arise to help the Māori people as he had done. Their late vicar's final request for the Pākehā people was, Will you pray for my Māori people? Then followed the complete list of over 150 mourners, poor bearers and representatives of churches of the diocese and the many organisations with whom the Reverend Frere had been connected during his lifetime, as well as the detailed names of all those who gave floral tributes. The Māoris loved and honoured Mr Frere. When he visited them, they saw in his face their forebears, whom he had cared for and buried when they died. They looked upon him as Tohonga, and to him they told things they would not tell an ordinary man. To the Māori he was Father Confessor. He was an authority on our proverbs, whakatauki, and on our folklore and legends. His patience, perseverance, and his powers of diagnosis gave him a fuller understanding of the spiritual forces as conceived by the Māori mind. Realising the tremendous mana that the supernatural and mystic had over the Māori, he introduced a type of worship which brought the Māori mind back to that of their forebears. Colour, light and the ancient Catholic Church won the hearts of his Māori children. 
There was a very large gathering at the Baptist Church, Rangiora, North Canterbury, on New Year's Day to witness the marriage of Miss Sissy Elizabeth Sansom, third daughter of Mr William Sansom, one of the original promoters and a director of the Kaipoi Woolen Mills, to Mr Harry Walter Freer, third son of Mr Michael Freer of Dunedin. The Reverend William Barry was the officiating clergyman and the service was a very impressive one. The bridesmaids were Miss Elizabeth Sansom, sister of the bride, and Miss Beatrice Freer, sister of the bridegroom. The best man was Mr Neil, and the groomsman Mr F. Turner. The bride's dress was a handsome white silk, beautifully tucked, trimmed with lace and chiffon, transparent yoke of chiffon, veil and orange blossoms. The bridesmaid's dresses were of pretty white muslin, trimmed with lace and insertion, transparent yokes and white chiffon hats, handsome green stone brooches mounted with gold, the gift of the bridegroom. Mrs Freer, mother of the bridegroom, wore a handsome black figured brooch dress and pink and gold bonnet. Mrs T. H. Thompson, sister of the bride, grey costume with grey and black toque. Mrs J. Sansom, aunt of the bride, handsome black Mouveau dress relieved with white black hat. The rest of the ladies were very handsomely attired in various suitable costumes. After the ceremony, an adjournment was made to Riversdale, the residence of the bride's father, and refreshments were provided for all in a handsome marquee, specially erected for the occasion, and a few hours were pleasantly spent. Photographs of the wedding party and also of the guests were taken during the intervals. The presents were laid out in the drawing room, and were numerous and handsome, and amounted to over a hundred, among them being several substantial cheques, and a very valuable marble clock and beautiful beautiful vases, presented to Mr H. W. Freer by his fellow employees in the DIC Christchurch. The happy couple left in the afternoon for the south with good wishes and showers of rice and flowers. One cannot fail to notice the reporter's affection for and repetition of the word handsome no less than seven times in the description. Maybe the editor missed checking that one. From New Zealand Papers Past, here is the marriage notice of Albert Vernon Freer, Christchurch Press, 11th of October 1919. Freer Sanderlands a very quiet wedding was celebrated at the Church of the Good Shepherd, Phillipstown Christchurch, on Wednesday afternoon last, the bride and bridegroom being members of two old Dunedin families. Mr Albert Vernon Freer, fifth son of the late Mr and Mrs Freer, Sandhurst Kaipoi, and Miss Medina Ethel Sanderlands, youngest daughter of Mr and Mrs R Sanderlands of Queen's Drive, Musselburgh, Dunedin. Miss Sanderlands was, till recently, science mistress at the Epsom Girls Grammar School in Auckland. The ceremony was performed by the Reverend Charles Freer, brother of the bridegroom, and Mrs C. Freer officiated at the organ. The bride was given away by her father and was attended by Dr Nora Hanron. Mr Hugh Freer acted as best man. Only the immediate relatives of both families were present. It will have to remain a mystery as to why this was such a quiet affair. It was less than 12 months since Albert's father had died, so perhaps this was still within the accepted period of mourning. His mother, Jane, died 7th of August 1924. Hugh Freer is the same person with which this oral history began, my great-great-uncle. My father had one sister, Thelma, who never married. I am Jack's daughter and Malcolm's sister. Our mother Brenda died when I was just 10 months old and when I was four my father married again to Marion Idol. Of course Marion was the only mother I had ever known and she was a singularly special person. My parents had a wonderfully happy marriage providing a stable and loving childhood upbringing for me and my brother. I have just published the Frere family history 
as it relates directly to my lineage from Hugh Frere, 1616, through 14 generations down to the present day. It was written as a gift to my three children and ten grandchildren, as well as to my brother, his three children and four grandchildren. What I find fascinating about my family's journey from early France to Christchurch, New Zealand, are the many fortuitous circumstances which allowed the lineage to survive. Firstly, unlike his mother and two sisters, Hugh Frere did not succumb to the Black Plague. Secondly, as Huguenots, his family escaped the overwhelming religious massacres which took place in France. Thirdly, their journey in a sailing ship over the Atlantic Ocean to New Paltz, New York, was successful, as was their settling into a new life there. Fourthly, Michael's sentence of execution in 1838 was commuted to banishment to the colonies. Fifthly, despite the horrific and harsh conditions both on the convict ship voyage to Van Diemen's Land and subsequent working environment, Michael survived. Several of his colleagues did not. His son Michael took risks emigrating to New Zealand and walking over harsh terrain to the pioneering areas of the gold fields. He lived on to father a large family, be a good provider and community-minded person. I am proud to be part of this amazing history and have enjoyed sharing it with you. The final line of my book is taken from Psalm 90 verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, so may it continue to be.